in which case he is seducing the child for the child's sake, not necessarily his own. In any event, we need now to focus, to focus on the trick, the trick explained and demonstrated to the sailor, which is very technical concerning that one thirty-second of an inch. What I would like to say, what I need to say, is that this requires a skill as highly tuned as the man binding the blue feather. The body is just as important as with the man binding the feather too. The ship plunges and heaves, the man braces his legs, he is stiff but flexible, his legs are like pylons, but his arms have to be relaxed, striving to move at one thirty-second of an inch and no more. We need to focus, that is, on the concept of the trick and its relation to magic and to things that tell stories. We might think of a trick as something fraudulent, but then as with a modern conjurer, fraud too requires an exact mimesis of nature. Think back to the aeroplane wing. Think back to the blue feather keeping straight this arrow in flight. So we need to be thinking of the trick as something scientific and real, bearing a scrupulous understanding and manipulation of things, including the human body, in relation to such things. But as trick, the trick slides. It seduces, it cajoles, hey Duchess! It knows and enjoys the leap beyond the thingness of things. Is this why the sailor goes to such lengths to inform us that the winch is the same as used by old man Noah? It belongs to pre-flight times. Quote, all the little goblins of those far off times which were to be destroyed by the flood had found refuge in the Yorokie, where they lived in all the corners and nooks. The worst of these little evil spirits had taken up their quarters in this winch. The stokehold is dimly illuminated by two heavy iron lamps, the same as the Yorokie carried when she was sailing to Carthage from Tyre in the old days. You can see lamps like these in the British Museum, he says, the sailor. But those on the Yorokie use wicks made from rags in the engine room and are fueled by spent oil from the ship's engines, which of course did not exist, the engines, in the old days. The old days is actually a talismanic phrase that ushers in prehistory, and hence the enchanted world when things spoke to man. That is Schiller's understanding, and it goes along with what is felt to be a certain lack or loss of poetry, of poetry and ritual in modern workaday life. But you ask, has that really disappeared? Does enchantment not resurface? Does enchantment not resurface under certain conditions? Maybe extreme conditions in the world of machines, corporate control, and consumerism that we call modernity. Here you might do well to think of an intellectual and artistic strategy like what I take from Benjamin, that of demystification and re-enchantment, facilitated, in my mind, by humour, as we find with our sailor. You might also think of Australian Dreamtime when, at extraordinary times, initiated by the human community, prehistory gushes forth in the present, and distinctions between land, animals and people are spectacularly different to what they appear to be in the present. This is the same return of the repressed I came across with much of South American shamanism at times of menstruation, pregnancy, sorcery, and sickness. The sailor's story is an outstanding instance of this, and hence of what Benjamin was getting at with his idea of profane illumination, at once mystical, yet down to earth. At one point where he suggests that the storyteller borrows his authority from death, Benjamin says death sinks the story into nature, or to be more exact, into natural history. Yet such is the movement inspired by death that the story lifts off from natural history into something supernatural. Quote, the lower Leskov, the writer Nikolai Leskov, the lower Leskov descends on the scale of created things, Benjamin writes, the more obviously does his way of viewing things approach the mystical. This must be why this ship tells stories to her crews. Nobody on the ship speaks the same language, but they all tell stories to each other. The best stories, however, as Isabel would say, however, are the ones the ship tells. The crew may leave a ship, points out B. Traven, but their stories never leave. Quote, a story penetrates the whole ship and every part of it, the iron, the steel, the wood, all the holes, the coal bunkers, the engine hall, the stoke hold, even the bilge. 
Out of these parts, full of hundreds and thousands of stories, tales and yarns, the ship tells the stories over again with all the details and minor twists. She tells the stories to her best comrades, that is to the members of the crew. She tells the stories better and more exactly than they could ever be told in print. Let us pause for a moment, however, however, and note the chronology of cause and effect here. It is the sailors who tell each other stories, stories about the ship or stimulated by the ship, and then the ship comes alive, hoards the stories, retells them, and makes up its own stories, which are presumably compounds of the sailors' stories told over millennia. It is storytelling that animates the ship and keeps it going. Stories and the coal, the stoker's shovel into the furnace. Stories and the coal. You can have a ship functioning with a crew, but no skipper, says the sailor, but never a ship, but never have a ship sail with a skipper and no crew. That is why the ship always takes the side of the crew, says the sailor, because the crew cares for the ship, while the skipper's responsibility is to the company that owns the ship. The crew lays claim to a different kind of possession. Lays claim to a different, the crew lays claim to a different kind of possession than the owners and the officers. Theirs is an intimacy, we could say, an intimacy that comes about through their work. In the Death Ship, it is not the sparkling sea and ravishing sunset it feature in the sailor's tale, but labor, labor below decks. The work site is minutely described in a patient, detailed, down-to-earth way that, without fuss or fanfare, has nevertheless a visionary and mythical edge. Why is that? How can such apparently opposed philosophies, materialist and spiritual, be not only reconciled, but mutually reinforce one another? When introduced to his workspace below decks, where he will shovel coal into the furnace 15 hours a day, the sailor looks down into it. It's first view, right? Down there. Quote, the depth appeared to have no limit. At the bottom below, I saw the underworld. It was a smoke-filled hell, brightened up by darting spears of reddish light which seemed to dash out of different holes and disappear as suddenly as they had come. As if he had been born in his thick smoke, the naked shape of a human being stepped into the center of the hall. He was black from the thick color coal dust which covered all of his body and the sweat ran down him in streams, leaving glittering traces in the soot of his body. He stared motionless in the direction from which the reddish lights came flaring out. Now he moved heavily about and seized a long iron poker. He stepped the pace forward, bent over, and suddenly it looked as if he was swallowed up by a sea of flames, which enwrapped him 